I'm sorry, madam. Only half a pound to a customer. That'll be 25 cents. But couldn't you? I'm sorry. A chair and chair alike. We do have a fine margin at only 24 cents a pound. Oh, margin. <laughs> Those price controls. Is that all you've got? Hamburger? First class grade, only 27 cents a pound. I don't care what it costs. I want a good steak. At this OPA, take off price controls and we'll have plenty. I don't see how it'll make the cows breed any faster. Tom Gray had his groceries for the weekend. But he hadn't found everything he wanted. Tom was a puzzled man. The war had caused shortages, he knew that. But after all these months of peace, things ought to be better. Maybe it was these price controls. The newspapers blamed the OPA. Not only one paper, or two, but practically all of them. The radio blamed OPA. Senator O'Daniel, Democrat, said today, and I quote, if a man owns a pound of butter, he should get all he can for it. The people were confused. You're wrong. Oh, you're wrong. Look, it's simple. The more you produce, the more you buy. Production goes up, prices come down. Yeah, but suppose the manufacturer doesn't let the prices come down. He's got to. He's got to, my foot. All right, you wait and see. You wait and see. OPA is ruining the country. OPA is saving the country. Eliminate control. Keep control. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Poor Tom, trying to escape from it all. Yes, sir. Our business leaders are not afraid to call a spade a spade. Listen, if OPA is permanently discontinued, the production of goods will mount rapidly, and through free competition, prices will quickly adjust themselves to levels that consumers are willing to pay. Bull, just plain bull. My dear boy, they know what they are talking about. They are the men who run industry. Oh, they're just a bunch of sharks. Listen. Just listen to this. The members of the National Association of Manufacturers have no intention of rocking the inflation boat, now or at any other time. Oh, no, none at all. Just take off control, that's all. Why, brother, they'll skin us alive. Young man, you sound just like a red. These are the men that know what they're talking about. You're next, sir. I got it. Where's that brother-in-law of mine? I don't know. He should have been here half an hour ago. Listen. It's all right, sis. It's time for dinner. I'll play it for him later. All right, then. There's no doubt about it. Those fellows know what they're talking about. Hello, dear. Where have you been? Pete's been waiting for you. Oh, Pete, listen to this. Members of the National Association of Manufacturers Pat, have no... pack of wolves. But look here, Pete. They show you right here. You knock off price controls and you increase production and lower prices. It makes sense. It's bunk, Tom. Hello, sweetie. But listen, Pete, these are the men that can make promises. Yeah. And break them. Okay, Kitty. Let's go home. But remember, Tom, they're just giving you double talk. Maybe we 
could even get that car. There you go, Tom. Dreaming again. With promises and lies, big business won a Republican Congress. The Truman administration promptly fell into line. Together, they raced to scrap price controls. Big business ran America, right into an orgy of profiteering. months, prices jumped a third. Look, look, five dollars for this. It costs more every day. We need a raise. We need low prices. She's right, Pete. I'd rather have low prices than a raise. Me too. But what chance have we got of low prices or getting price control? With this Congress, None at all. Well, we need a decent Congress, all right. You said it. But that's at least a year away. And in the meantime, what do we do? Sit on our hands? Well, it's getting worse every week. And you know it. That's true, Tom. I don't care what you say. If wages go up, prices go up. It's a vicious circle. It's economic. Nuts. It's company propaganda. Look, you come to the union hall tonight. Oh, Pete, don't start that business again. Come on, we're giving a movie tonight on that wages and prices business. It's supposed to be good. Why don't you, Tom? It sounds interesting. Okay. Looks new. It is. Isn't that a honey? Looks complicated. No, a baby could run it. Movies are fine thing. Folks come out to meetings. Yeah, just take a look at that crowd. Yeah. Let's get a seat. Today, people are being squeezed. Squeezed out of food, clothing, necessities, because of rising prices. Just think back to 1939 and prices at that time. A broadcloth shirt, 88 cents. A pair of shoes, $1.95. And as for food, butter, 31 cents a pound. Chuck roast, 15 cents. Then prices started upward as big business took advantage of the war. Uncle Sam established the OPA and cracked down. In 1946, controls were removed. Prices shot up. In 18 months, they went up as much as in the whole previous seven years. These prices mean big trouble to families, as shown by experts from the University of California the Heller Committee, who prepared a minimum budget for a family of four. Its standards are not very high. For example, father gets one overcoat every six years, three work shirts a year. For mother, two house dresses a year, food for a week, nine loaves of bread, 
less than two dozen eggs, a pound and a half of butter and oleo, milk, a little over two quarts a day. This modest budget cost about $75 a week in January 1948. The administration considered even this budget too optimistic, so the Bureau of Labor Statistics estimated a more realistic one, a little less of everything. For vacation and savings, practically nothing. This super modest budget averaged $65 in January 1948, while at the same time, manufacturing wages were around $51 a week. It's a simple, sober fact that most people cannot live on their pay because of high prices and inflation. What's the reason for inflation? Not high prices, according to the National Association of Manufacturers, who say inexpensive ads. Inflation comes when the flow of money into the market is greater than the flow of goods. The NAM says that production and incomes, or goods and money, are the controlling factors in prices. If there are more goods than dollars, prices go down. If there are more dollars than goods, prices go up. Sounds reasonable, but it's only half of the story. This explanation leaves out price fixing, monopolies, speculation, market rigging, it leaves out the basic reason for today's inflation, and that is the killing of OPA. Let's analyze this inflation business. It's important. Here is production, goods. Here is the money people get for producing. During the war, half of production was military. And while civilian goods were less, Money increased because of payments to soldiers, their dependents, and others. Here it is, less goods and more money. Prices should zoom, according to the NAM. But they didn't, because Uncle Sam established controls. People shared the goods at reasonable cost. The money which wasn't spent went into savings. This is the picture during the war. The war ended. Army goods went back to civilians. There was less money because overtime was cut. Therefore, money and goods were more in balance. There was less reason for inflation. With OPA continuing, savings would have gone for washing machines, houses, automobiles, and refrigerators. For many years to come, we would have had prosperity, a sound, stable prosperity. Instead, government-controlled prices were replaced by business-controlled profits. Prices went up. Wages were used for food and clothing, but wages weren't enough. Savings went for food and clothing. Ten billion savings in a year. Millions of GIs were promised this. They're getting this because of big business prices. The blow of inflation upon our economic security seems like an act of nature, but it actually is the result of acts by big business, and the people are beginning to discover who is responsible for inflation. To postpone this discovery, big business is putting up a barrage of propaganda. Here are their excuses. And here are the facts against them, as dug out from official government sources. Excuse number one, the farmers are to blame. One of the principal causes for high prices is federal support of farm prices. The Department of Agriculture finds that of the increases in food prices in the last year, the bulk went to food trusts. And Senator Aiken of Vermont underlines the facts. It is my belief that a campaign against farmers is being indulged in to divert attention from the real profiteers in food and clothing, the speculators and commodity gamblers. Speculators. Men like Ed Pauley, oil operator, former Democratic committeeman, 
This man bought a half a million bushels of wheat, oats, corn. He didn't finance farmers. He didn't sow the wheat. He didn't harvest it. He didn't distribute it. He didn't even eat it. He just sat on it until a hungry world paid his price. Mr. Pauley feels no moral guilt. He was quoted by the press as saying, I dealt in everything I could make a profit in, in the good old American way. What a patriot, growing rich out of people's hunger. Mr. Pauley isn't the only profiteer. Here is a government report on the profits of the food trusts. In the past year, profits increased by as much as 320%. No wonder prices are high. One of these companies, the A&P, was charged with violating the Sherman Antitrust Act. Their extra take from housewives was estimated at $21 million. The company was found guilty and fined $175,000. Cheap enough at the price. No, gentlemen of the NAM, you cannot blame farmers for the high prices. The NAM has another excuse for high prices, strikes. High prices are due to strikes. 35 million man days of production were lost last year. 35 million man days. Sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Yet during the same time, illness or accidents caused this much loss to production. 600 million man days. Furthermore, in comparison to all man days worked, strike losses are practically nothing. To be exact, one third of one percent of the total nine billion. No, gentlemen of the NAM, you cannot blame high prices on strikes. But the biggest target of the NAM propaganda is wages. Labor costs come to 85% of expenses upon which prices are based. So naturally, if labor costs go up, prices go up. Simple arithmetic. Well, let's take a look at the miner for a concrete example. Miners average $65 a week for working underground, daily risking their lives as in the Centralia disaster. 111 dead. For this kind of work, the miners got an increase of $1.20 a day. Now let's see what happened to this increase under big business manipulation. The cost of the increase for coal produced was 40 cents per ton. For these three tons, the coal companies increased their prices by $4.50. Three tons of coal make two tons of steel. The steel companies increased their prices on two tons by as much as $20. Two tons of steel are used in the average car. Auto companies increased their prices by as much as $100. Big business doesn't know how to add. It only learned the multiplication table. No wonder prices go up. Wage increases have no relation to price increases. This is true throughout industry. Here are wage increases in typical industries. Practically all are less than 5% of the price increases. Now, keeping the same scale for easy comparison, take a look at the price increases. The facts are obvious. There is no relation between wages and prices, as economic experts have known for a long time. No, gentlemen of the NAM, wage increases are not responsible for price increases. Let's see what is responsible for high prices. Auto increased its prices more than steel, and steel more than coal. Why? 
The answer lies in the degree of monopoly each industry. Let's examine these industries more closely. Take the three largest producers in each. In coal mining, the three largest companies produce only 7% of all coal. In steel, the largest three produce 60% of the total. In auto, the largest three produce 90% of all cars. In other words, the auto industry is controlled by a few companies. The coal industry is not. Coal mining is very competitive. Auto is monopolistic. As a result, they can and do charge more. They can and do make bigger profits. Take the profit level at 100 for 1946 and compare 1947. In coal mining, profits up 56%. In steel, up 84%. In auto, up 125%. These increases in profits are not unusual. Throughout all industries, profits are incredible. Here is the golden year of American business, 1929. Now let's compare the last five years with 1929. The war years were very profitable. American manhood suffered a million casualties but corporations averaged nearly 10 billion a year. Then in 1946, big business broke all profit records. And in 1947, the take was out of this world, $17 billion. In two years, corporations cleared $29.5 billion net. In two years, big business collected for themselves as much money as was collected by the entire federal government of the United States from taxpayers from the time of George Washington to that of Herbie Hoover, a total of 140 years. No wonder prices are up. These profits are so outrageous that big business is trying to minimize them through a huge campaign of ads and pamphlets. Typical is this pamphlet of the NAM, which is based on their latest propaganda trick, the argument of the sales dollar. To show up this phony argument, let's take Armour & Company as an example. According to the company figures, they make only a couple of pennies on each dollar of sales. Aside from these two and a half cents, all of the dollar is going to pay for labor and plant and materials and supplies of all kinds connected with the job of giving you meat. Therefore, says Armour, they only make 2.6% profit, which is very low. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? But it's phony. Most of this dollar is spent before armor begins working, which is right here. This part of the dollar is paying for activities that have nothing to do with armor or meat processing. This part is paying for armor's operations. And when we look at it closely, we find that for its work in processing meat, armor gets two and a half cents all right, but these few little pennies represent a profit to armor of 17% on the value of their work. And 17% for each armor dollar is a very high rate of profit. But armor isn't the only profiteer in this picture. Let's examine what goes on before processing. Here are the cattle that provide the meat for your table. Producing these cattle involves nearly the whole economy of the United States. Just to give an idea, it takes grain to feed the cattle. It takes tractors to plow the fields that raise the grain and refineries to make gas for the tractors. And steel and cement to build refineries. And the railways to carry the steel and cement and the gas and the tractors and the grain and the cattle. And the banks to finance everything. All during these activities, profits are being made. Big profits, as big as armors, and that is why the price of meat is so high. The sales dollar argument hides all these profits. Profit must be figured on the basis of investment. That's what profit means to a banker, to an economist, to a businessman. GE is a good example which shows why. Let's take 1933 and 1947, a depression year and a boom year. In 1947, they made nearly six times as much. 
Here are their profits, no question about it. GE is making much more money now than in 1933. Now, here are their sales in 1933, and here are the sales in 1947. The sales dollar argument gives GE 10% profit in 1933, only 7% in 1947. In 1933, GE actually had a higher rate of profit. Maybe they ought to go back to the Depression. Silly, isn't it? Now take profits again and compare them to investments, as bankers do. It's a different picture. Profit rate in 1947 is 20%, practically five times above 1933. This makes sense. Very high volume of profits, a very high profit rate. Everybody's happy except the consumer. The unreasonable degree of profiteering is shown by the amount of money made on each worker. Here's the total of GE profits before taxes. Here are Westinghouse profits. And here are General Motors, a grand total of $742 million. These three corporations employ over half a million people, a total of 640,000 workers. For every worker, therefore, these companies make $20 a week profits, $20 a week on every worker every week. The average wage at this time was about $51. For every $5 in wages, the companies made $2 in profits. You would think these companies would be ashamed of themselves. But big business has no shame, for big business has no soul. It's out for profits, big profits, and cares nothing for people's needs. Profits which they make through controls, direct controls and indirect controls, but always real controls over the whole economy of the United States. We know the facts of this picture thanks to the investigations of the Roosevelt administration. Eight big business groups control over 30% of all the assets of the United States, the heart of the economy. Said Wendell Burge, once head of the government's antitrust division. Of the 100 largest corporations in the United States, 44 are now defendants in antitrust suits because of their ability to manipulate, inflation is enriching the monopolies. It is hurting the people. It must be stopped. We, the people, can and must call a halt to this arrogant misuse of power. <laughs> Democracy demands the defeat of monopolies and the monopoly power. The people can do it. The people will do it. Easy to say, but hard to do. Reaction towers over our daily lives seemingly all-powerful. Yet there is a mightier power, a power far greater than wealth, the power of people. Organized and united. Widespread organization built up through years of hard work. giving the working man strength at the bargaining table, some voice in his pay envelope, a degree of economic security. This ability to organize and fight is rooted in our political freedom. Today, this freedom is in jeopardy. Reactionary representatives in Congress are fronting for corporations in their attack against labor in their attack against the people through the Taft-Hartley Act, through the attacks on civil liberties, the jail sentences, the contempt charges, the deportation proceedings. These men must be replaced. We must act. We must vote. We must preserve our great democratic tradition by electing men whose first concern is the welfare of the people.
We need such men, men of conviction, not puppets of military brass hats and Wall Street profiteers. We need leaders with a deep abiding sense of democracy and decency. Today, only the political victory of progressive Americans can assure peace and prosperity for the nation. A happy life for ourselves and our children. A future we can face with confidence.